Good morning, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be here on Christmas morning and to celebrate the birth of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. 700 years or so before the birth of Christ, there was a young man who was only a boy. And for 60 years, he kept on writing and he kept on speaking to the people of Israel about Jesus Christ. Yep, 700 years before the birth of Christ, the most, probably the most accurate picture of Jesus Christ was written by a man called, a young boy called Isaiah. And he ended up dying for his own faith. And you've got to read the book. It's about 60 plus chapters in the Old Testament. And um, he gives us a really unique insight. In fact, some of the songs we've been singing this morning and a lot of our, our carols come from Isaiah's insight that he gained. God gave him insight to tell us about the Messiah, the Saviour that was going to come into our world. And he encourages us. Look, the very first verse of chapter 6, he gives us a context here. And uh, because he was going through intense grief, he had a grief experience. And he says this, in the year that the best king in the world, the one who he respected because he was so good, King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated high and exalted. In a time where... He was saying, in the year where my world fell apart, at a time when everything that we had known to be stable became unstable, because this king was good, and there were some rotten kings in Israel. And so he is feeling it. In the year that the person I deeply loved passed from this life to the next. You know, he could have said, in the year that my partner walked out on me. In the year that my personal finances sunk to a new low. In the year I did something really stupid and consciously stepped into a sin that hurt me and other people. In the year my world fell apart, he says, I saw the Lord. At a time when nothing made sense, I gained a fresh revelation and appreciation about God. I saw him high and lifted up, he says. I found that his presence and power and peace were enough to keep me going. In the year that my world rocked, I experienced God afresh. This young boy says these words. And for some of you this morning, at this Christmas service, you need a fresh appreciation of God and of his son whose birth we celebrate today. And Isaiah said many things, but let me just say three things, the things about God that he tells us. And it's my prayer that uh, Isaiah's insights during his personal season of difficulty will impact you at this Christmas time. So what did Isaiah see? He actually saw that God, the God of the universe, the God who created the heavens and the earth was going to visit the planet. Yep, he was actually going to come and visit the planet and walk among us. He says in Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and we will call him Emmanuel, which means God will be with us. He's going to visit us. He foresaw the virgin birth. The incarnation of God. That God will be born into the human race and become one of us and yet also remain fully God. Hey, do you understand that? No, I don't understand it. I've been walking the way of Jesus for 46 years. I don't understand. I just accept it. That Jesus of Nazareth was fully a human being like I am and he was also at the same time fully God. One of the great paradoxes. Don't fully understand it, but I accept it. It's a mystery that awes us and makes us want to worship. And I loved our, our, our singers this morning as they're singing those songs. All they can do is go, ah, oh, Jesus. The response is worship. When you hear the story, you think nobody could make this up. 
this is too fantastic. There's a ring of truth about it. It's so authentic that when you read it, and you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you think, man, whoever made this story up must be God himself, because it's too fantastic. There's nothing like it in all of human history. No religion comes close, no philosophy, no idea that God would actually visit us. Jesus of Nazareth was on this earth for 33 years. Jesus of Nazareth is now in heaven representing us to God, our heavenly father. That he is the one that takes all our prayers and all of our, our sins. And when we actually call out to God through him, he doesn't look at our sins anymore because we put our trust in him who becomes our sin bearer. Um, he will forever. What's it going to look like? Do you know what it's going to look like? I don't know how you see Jesus in heaven. I mean, there are pictures where he's got blue eyes and blonde and white fella. And uh, he, he looks more like a black fella, actually. He's probably dark. But when you look at him, there's nothing nice physically that you will see. You know what you'll see? You'll see a man whose body has been battered and broken and his face and head has been disfigured forever the eternal son who became Jesus of Nazareth will look like a 33 year old Palestinian Jew whose body and face has been massacred and when we look at him we say oh Jesus you did it for me and Isaiah says this we'll, we'll see in a few moments the second thing that Isaiah could see is that God would reveal himself to us. Not just that God will actually visit us, but that he would reveal himself. No more mystery. No more human beings trying to find God. Well, they're still trying to find God. That's what religion does. And I don't think religion is evil and bad. And in fact, at university, I did four years of studying all the other religions, from Islam to Hinduism and Buddhism to Confucianism to the shamans of Indonesia. To, and just fascinating. There's always been this quest within the human heart to find reality, to find meaning. Why am I here? What's the purpose in life? I was just watching an interview of George Harrison, who one of the Beatles, and uh, loved the Beatles. Anyone here also loved the Beatles? Oh, three of you. Okay, well. <laughs> and the thing that impressed me about George, out of all of them, was his search for meaning. And as he's dying, and he gives his final interview, and he says, you know, life... He goes, we've got to find the meaning of life. And he said, and he said, you know, really, he goes, unless we face our death and know where we're going, and he's trying to, he's still trying to find the way, and he tried through different religions and expressions. And I pray that he did find the way finally in those final few weeks through Jesus Christ, knowing that he's the only way that you can be assured of heaven. But there's something in the human heart that, that searches and desires. And that's what religion is. Religion is trying to find God. So I'm not negative about religion. I just say, hey, Christianity is about a relationship. God actually visits the planet. And he doesn't just visit, but he says, now have a look into these eyes. Listen to these words. Feel my touch. God among you. I'm going to reveal my nature, my character, my will. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to interact with you so that all your confusion and all your misunderstandings can go and that you can finally have assurance that there is a way to heaven, that you can know you can get there, and that's through putting your confidence in me as, as God's son and the one who's going to carry away all your sins, the barrier that separates you, all your wrongdoings between you who are imperfect and a perfect God who cannot look upon sin. God is so perfect, he cannot look upon sin and wrongdoing. He's a God of great justice. And so he found a way by which he could look at us and say, you're forgiven. You have a right standing with me. My son is going to take all the sins of the world upon his own shoulders. And that's why his body was battered and broken. That little baby. You can't understand Christmas unless you link it in with Easter. And I love this, how God would reveal himself. Isaiah chapter 9, moving on for a couple of chapters. He says, for to us... A child is born. To us, a son is given. Notice, is given to us. And the government will be on his shoulders. This is a government of love. This is a government of peace. This is a government uh, that's non-coercive. It's a government that doesn't have police powers. 
It's, it's only powers is the power of a story and the power of his love and the power of his spirit to draw people to him. There will be a day when his government, the physical government, will come to him when he wraps everything up and deals with all the, the terrible evil in our world once and for all. But now it's an era by which he invites people to experience his life and he doesn't force his will upon us. But it says, and the government will be upon his shoulders and he will be called four things. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So Isaiah foresaw that God's nature and character would be revealed through Jesus while he ministered to people for three and a half years. The hallmarks of God's good nature can be seen through Jesus' words and his actions. And for me, my story is he's my wonderful counsellor. And I know he's the wonderful counsel of so many people. That God's wisdom is given to us through Christ in all matters to do with this life. He's our great guide. He is the mighty God. God's limitless supernatural power can deal with any of life's problems. He's our miracle worker. I've experienced that and so have so many of you. He's our everlasting father. God's loving and compassionate heart can heal any hurt and bridge any relationship breakdown. What an endlessly loving, heavenly dad we have. And he's the Prince of Peace. God's answer is his peaceful presence to restore our broken relationship with him and to be able to build a new life connected with him. This is the only real lasting solution to peace in our world. You despair when you look at the, 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 the news. And at times I think I have to turn it off. There's so much evil. There's so much hatred. People that just want to kill each other. And the, the, the social divides, the racial divides, the religious divides. You see what's happening in Syria. And the bottom line, the bottom line above anything else is that two branches of Islam hate each other. The Sunni branch represented in Saudi Arabia and the Shiite branch represented in Iran. One group are Arabs, the other group are Persians. They speak Farsi in Iran, they speak Arabic in there, and they are doing this proxy war in Syria and in Yemen because they hate each other. Same religion and divide. And we might say, well, what a terrible religion. Well, the same thing happened in Europe in the 1500s among Christians, Catholics and Protestants. The Hundred Years' War. They kind of killed each other. And so that's the opposite of real Christianity. That's just religion, a form of Christianity. And I think even with, with Islam, if people understand it, and I'm not at all saying people should become Islamic, but it actually, the tenets are taken from the Old Testament and the New Testament, and there's some great things in there. There's some things we don't agree with, but it's people that take stuff out of context and use it to kill and to maim and to do all kinds of evil. And the elite in both those countries are fighting these wars, and they don't care if a million people die. What's the answer? To that, and then there are a hundred other crises in our world that are taking place. You know, the only answer is for us to come to understand the Prince of Peace. And uh, this Prince of Peace that, that brings peace in our hearts between us and God and our sins can be forgiven. And somehow our inner life can be made whole as we feel secure and safe. And we can love all people. We don't have to, ex we don't have to accept them, we don't have to agree with everyone. But you can accept people as they are, you don't have to agree with them. And then he gives you the ability to be able to live in a peaceful relationship among ourselves. And where genuine Christianity reigns, I tell you, his government, the increase of his government and peace, there'll be no end. When we see him as the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. You read the four gospels for yourself and you'll see God walking among us, talking to us, helping all kinds of people. God's heart is for people, including you today, to choose to willingly submit to his non-coercive government of love and peace before the return of Christ. I did it in my life, and uh, I can tell you my life changed for the better. <laughs> Last night, I had a beautiful older gentleman. No, he wasn't. When I said older gentleman, he's probably younger than me. <laughs> Late 50s. And a family member brought him along, and, uh, and he, I went up and shook his hand, and... And he goes, 
you ain't converting me. And I thought, and he was really deadly serious. I said, sir, I said, I wouldn't even try because I can't. I said, it's only Jesus. I took my hand and I said, but I will pray for you. Looks at me and I walked off and at the door. I said, how did you enjoy the service? He goes, it was good, but nothing's happened. I said, I'll keep praying for you. So that was a funny experience. And uh, it was a powerful service last night. We had the beautiful string section, beautiful orchestra. It was just a powerful service. And I know for anyone who was here, uh, heard the message of Jesus. And if you're here today and you're not a regular churchgoer, we're thankful that you're here for this Christmas Day service. And my appeal to you is think about Jesus. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for yourself. You can Google it. You can check it out. Read the story, and you will see, as you read it with honesty and and openness of heart, you will discover the God that Isaiah reveals here. And, uh, And the final thing, the final great insight, is that God will die to save us. Wow. That God's going to die to save us. The Christmas story is linked to Easter. Isaiah foresaw the passion of Jesus. His heart would have been breaking as he describes the suffering of this God-man on our behalf. I'd love, I'm going to ask him when I get to heaven, what were you thinking, Isaiah, when you actually got the under? Did you understand what was going to happen? I think Isaiah, as he's reading it, he's seeing this suffering servant, but he's also seeing this king who's going to rule And I think he's he's kind of probably mixing the two metaphors, the two illustrations together. And one day Jesus will physically rule and reign in this world. But now it's an era of grace. And he invites people to enter into his life, his resurrection life, by placing their faith in him. So his heart would have been breaking, I reckon, as he describes the suffering of this God-man that he sees in his mind. See, half the Gospels, you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The unique thing about the Gospels is half of them center on the final week of Jesus' life. He lived for 33 years. Half the record is about the final week. In fact, probably a quarter to a third is about the final day because it all culminates on a cross. God's purposes, where he visits the planet, he reveals himself to us, and now he shows us his love, his his love in an amazing way by instead of us being condemned and judged for all our personal wrongdoings, he himself took the rap and carried our sins and dies on a cross. And Isaiah accurately writes about Jesus' final hours and how it was all part of God's plan to save us from our sins. So as he's writing this, and and I want us to read the most famous and magnificent 53rd chapter and linger as we read this, hey? This is Isaiah, 700 years before the birth of Christ. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows familiar with suffering. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. Notice that it was for our sins, not his, as he was sinless. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. Notice that? We have peace because he took our punishment. And by his wounds, we are healed. Our sins, our our broken relationship with God, our inner life can be healed. And we can ask him for physical healing even now. And many times he actually does provide physical healing for people as a sign that there's going to be ultimate healing of soul and body in heaven where there'll be no more sin, no more sickness, no more suffering, no more pain. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We mucked up, but he took it. He took it for us. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. In other words, he died among thieves, which we know there were thieves on either side of 
of the cross. One of them turned to him and put his trust in Christ and we'll see him in heaven. Not the other one. So among thieves and murderers, the grave of the wicked, and with the rich in his death, Joseph of Arimathea, one of the richest men in Jerusalem, Lance said, take my tomb. I've been to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. I've seen how wealthy he was in the garden tomb and it, it just takes your, your, your breath away and you see Golgotha out in, in the, the... You say, wow, that does look like a skull. I don't actually think the, the Greek Orthodox place where it is in there is the, is the authentic one. That's my personal belief. I reckon General Gordon, when he came and saw it, he said, that's it. Then they've dug out this place and this, this tomb and wine press and all that stuff. And I tell you, it speaks that this man died among murderers and thieves, identifying with the lowliest of our society. And yet... There was a rich man that said, hey, I want him to be in my tomb and uh, he can take it. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, that's you and me, and prolong his days and the Lord and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. Somehow, in spite of the, of the evil of Christ being put to death, God's plan and purpose was outworked to save us so that we could get to heaven. What a fantastic story. What an amazing story. No religion comes close to this. That God would visit the planet. That he would reveal himself. That he would die for our sins and reconcile us back to himself. And on the basis of, of his obedience, we were disobedient, he was obedient. And that's credited to us. He was faithful, we were faithless. That's accredited to us, given a right standing. And we just say, thank you, we receive it. We, we look at the cross and we see a crucified saviour, but we also see an empty cross, a resurrected Lord who went back to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit. And today, this baby who was born in Bethlehem is the saviour of the world. He is the Lord of creation. He is the one who can transform any heart. And if you reach out to him this Christmas day and just pray a prayer, I tell you, God will visit you personally. He did that to me 46 years ago. And I tell you, my life changed and it's been for the better. I would hate to imagine what life would be without Jesus Christ really being in my life. I'd like us to stand together as I lead you in a prayer. Let's stand.